Venus and star blessings, everybody. Yes, I've deliberately made this set up here. Coco wanted to jump on the table. And this fellow over here came to me yesterday. Isn't he gorgeous? He's been, uh, well, he's come to me in honour of Venus, Leo Morningstar. This is her primary animal, the lion, as the morning star, which is Ishtar of a card, the uh, Babylonian goddess. So just wanted to share you guys that because I'm going to talk a little bit about Venus today because there's something quite special happening literally today, actually, uh, regarding Venus. But anyway, just wanted to show you that. So he's here um, guarding my home. Guarding me and guarding my beautiful angel, Coco. So pop you back down there, Mr. Lion. And uh, we'll see what Coco does along the way. And say hi to everyone. <laughs> hi and bye. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about the full moon in Aries coming up. Uh, which is coming up just literally in a few days' time. And I also, as I said, will touch on some key themes about Venus. Before I do, though, let me just say this, if I may. First of all, thank you to those of you who um, expressed your comments uh, regarding my five-minute uh, video that I did just yesterday about the importance of being respectful and not being a troll. And I just want to clear one thing up that um, I think is important to clear up. Freedom of speech is one thing. Trolling and attacking and bullying is a completely different thing. That is not about free speech. The definition of trolling and the definition of freedom have uh, completely different meanings. And I can put my, my money where my mouth is because I am absolutely 100% an advocate for freedom of speech. And those of you who follow me would be very, very well aware of that. And just to um, draw a reference point for that, to explain briefly why I say I put my money where my mouth is, is because, um, and let me say, this is just my own position, right? It, I'm not making a judgment on what others have chosen, each to their own. In the last three years where this narrative has taken over the entire globe, that has been involved in so many different things that have been created on the earth plane, which fundamentally speak to people's uh, freedom, sovereignty, liberties, freedom of choice, and so forth. We all know this. I don't need to repeat it. The only thing that I want to point out there is that I was one of the people who was fighting for freedom, for freedom of choice. Now, if somebody chose to follow what was suggested or coerced, that is entirely up to them. That it's none of my business what anybody does. It's only my business what I do. But the point is that I did stand for freedom. I fought for freedom and I paid the price for that from the point of view of being cast out of society, literally. So I can put my money where my mouth is when it comes to freedom. So um, my video yesterday was really just a, a reminder to all of us that freedom of speech has got to do with actually being responsible, ironically. People don't often associate the word responsibility with freedom, but this huge 
responsibility that comes with freedom at the deepest level, at the most authentic level. Um, and that video was really just uh, a reminder to all of us that when we um, when we deliberately try to cause harm to another by our actions and our words, it has an impact. It has an impact in a number of different ways on ourselves and on others. And the message was really about reminding us all to be more mindful and more aware of our actions and our words, especially with a digital world of so many social media platforms where we have the liberty to share and communicate and post and whatever on so many different levels with really nobody monitoring it. Now, we're not talking about the, the matter of where freedom of speech in large collective matters has been tampered with. We, I know that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just simply talking about being a bully and being nasty, deliberately trying to hurt somebody, trying to tear them down because of your own stuff. That's really what the message was about, not about freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is absolutely um, vital. And the freedom to choose how we are going to live our lives, the choices we are going to make. So putting that aside, let's get into the full moon in Aries. Oh, and also um, just before I do that, just a reminder that my astrology classes are open. So we've just had the third class recently and that third class was um, was great actually. We talked about the quadruplicities which are the crosses uh, in the chart, which are made up of the fixed, mutable and cardinal qualities of the signs. And I did bring up some really amazing chart examples in that class, uh, one of them being Russell Brand, right, who's clearly under the microscope at the moment. So um, his chart is being activated literally like a Christmas tree at the moment. It's just bing, bing, beams of light everywhere. Things are going off everywhere. And the uh, astrological correspondence um, really does reflect the narrative of the story of what's playing out at the moment. And um, if you're interested in that class, you can have access to it. There are some other great chart examples that I point to from the point of view of uh, really powerful people historically um, and people who are still with us now that uh, are powerful leaders of some kind uh, who have a huge influence, impact, and make a difference, right, from a collective perspective, whether it's women's rights or whether it's freedom of speech or, you know, all those sorts of things. So anyway, the class um, is available if you if you want that, and also classes are open if you want to um, study with me and some others that are, are joining as well. So that being said, let's um, bring up some charts. And have a look, see. Don't know why a calculator came up. <laughs> um, okay, so first, I perhaps will just touch on this. Um, Venus. Okay, so Venus in Leo, uh, you know, started a long time ago. By the time she leaves Leo, actually, um, it, it'll be like virtually five months, right, which is a super long time. That's, of course, because she uh, had her retrograde uh, journey. There she is there at 20 degrees, okay. This is a very important day, a very important passage, because this is the third time and the final time she reaches this particular degree, 20 degrees of Leo. So it's a post-shadow period, as it is uh, called. And it is also the degree where she formed the Venus star point, the VSP, the Venus star point morning star that took place in Leo uh, in August was on this degree, okay? So this is, uh, it's kind of like the, the final, final passage 
of Venus in her uh, true power of being reborn as the morning star goddess, which has the Palace of Venus signature. And it is truly the, the hallmark of this new eight-year cycle really beginning now. And it may also uh, bring to culmination or bring some themes or um, some answers or some details to what this retrograde journey has been for you that may have meant finishing certain relationships, uh, disassociating from certain people, um, you know, uh, ending relationships. There's, there's, well, relationship is the key word here. Um, but everything that we've been going through in the last few months with Venus, which was her entering Leo, still being in evening star phase, then going retrograde, then forming the conjunction to the sun while she's retrograde, which is the morning star, then being reborn as the morning star. Then, uh, although in Melbourne she was visible the whole time, but for most people she went through a passage where she was invisible for a while, then becoming visible, which is Venus's uh, helical uh, phases basically. Um, then Venus went direct and now she's at that point where she's at the, she's reaching the last degrees of Leo, degrees that she's actually tracked before. So she's only um, reaching them now for the third time and the final time. So it's it's really the closure of what the last four months or so have meant, all things Venus in your life. And also um, she's going to pick up her final square to Uranus as well in the next couple of days. And so she had a square to Uranus. It'll be three times. This is the last one. And so because she's picking up this final square to Uranus and because she's, you know, sort of really far away from the sun now as far as Venus can get because she doesn't get further than 48 degrees away from the sun ever um, and she's closing off this cycle, it is a time to really um, ha have a think about what's been happening and even if there's been uncomfortable or unpleasant situations uh, or experiences, it's time to move on. It's time to just release and let them go. You know, step into, she's, Venus is lighting your heart. She's lighting the path for you over the next eight years, the longest cycle. The shorter cycle is 19 months and then the shorter cycle again is nine months. But it's really an eight-year period and she's lighting the path now, moving forward She's cleared what she doesn't need in her life anymore, all things Venus, <clears throat> and she's ready to move forward in her complete authority, in her complete heart-centred um, direction, you know, from her heart, Venus in Leo. And morning star, Pallas Athena, the warrior goddess, but... When we say warrior goddess, it's not about war. It's not about fighting and conflict. I'm not really speaking about those things. Those things can happen collectively, and indeed they are. In fact, someone told me the other day that at this point in time on the Earth plane, there are 19 different wars taking place, the most that there has ever been in, as far as, um, I don't know if that's true historically, I can't remember if he said that, but certainly in our lifetime you know, lots of uh, <laughs> warrior star goddess energy playing out on that collective field. But when I say, um, when I'm referring to Pallas Athena, warrior goddess, morning star from the point of view of Venus and the cycle speaking to our own personal journey, it is about actually taking action and being co-creative with the um, with the journey of our life on, on that external level. So, mm, and there she is, uh, conjunct Juno, exactly, you know, which is the principle of committed relationships that can be both personal and or professional. The square to Uranus, as I said, is the final square, and that might just um, break free 
something that has been troubling the last, um, you know, four or five months regarding Venus because Uranus is about breakthroughs and breaking free of certain things that um, either we have resisted ourselves or um, have suppressed ourselves. The Venus square Uranus is definitely an opportunity to be more aligned, more authentically aligned with our own values and the sorts of relationships that we want to have and maintain and nurture and be involved in. And that includes friends and things like that because Venus rules friendships as well. She's the face of so many different relationships. She's the relating principle. So those are just some um, highlights of Venus at the moment with her, you know, really completing this journey that she's been in for quite a few months. So let's go to the full moon. The full moon is in Aries and the new moon, which is this cycle, um, started in Virgo, didn't it? A couple of weeks ago we had a new moon in Virgo and here we are now at the full moon, which takes place on the 29th of September. That's uh, Melbourne, Australia time. Um, for you guys in the Northern Hemisphere, it will be the 28th of September. Never mind where everything is placed in this chart because this is just based for Melbourne. You know, as I always say, the best thing to do is have a look at where, where the new moon began, where is the full moon now relative to your own birth chart. This is just a regular full moon. In other words, it's not a lunar eclipse, um, but it is important. Every full moon is important to some extent. It's not life-changing and it may come and go with not a lot going on for many, many people. On the other hand, for some other people, it may be um, a very important month from a full moon position because it's just connecting to certain things in your chart, Aries planets in your chart, your Aries house that is being activated through other things that are going on. It could be an annual perfected year you're in. It could be secondary progressions. It could be very specific transits. So, you know, it, it's... It's just important to understand that every full moon is not life-changing. <laughs> um, it's a full moon. It's a time of illumination of some kind. It's a time of becoming more aware of certain things, right? So we have a lot of energy going on in Libra. Now, I'm pointing to Mars because, see, Mars here is at 21 degrees of Libra. Mars, of course, is the ruler of this full moon because Mars rules Aries, right? And... What I find really interesting is that I guess um, what started in Virgo, the new moon in Virgo, is now being um, illuminated in the full moon in Aries, which is ruled by Mars. And Mars is in his detriment in Libra, um, which means it's a weakened position, okay, of, of Mars. You know, it's the opposite sign of what Mars is um, at home in, which is Aries, hence it's in detriment. So I think Mars in Libra is a really interesting placement because it um, it's an archetype that is so much about autonomy, independence, personal power, freedom, <clears throat> directing your own goals and desires and passions and actions and so forth. Um, expressing your own individuality, all of those things are important. But when Mars is in Libra, we've got to uh, work with the Libra archetype, which is ruled by Venus. So we've got to bring in some diplomacy in our actions. You know, it's not, a, even though it's in detriment, in, in one way I think it's a, it's kind of a good thing with a full moon in Aries because it might just, um, you know, take a little bit of that edge off of that full moon in Aries that can be pretty um, pretty intense and impulsive. You know, Aries is very impulsive and extremely impatient, right? The Mars in Libra will slow down those wheels perhaps just a little bit. And furthermore to that, which I think expands on the point that I just made, is that the solar eclipse coming up after this full moon so the new moon in two weeks' time happens to be a solar eclipse. 
is on this degree here, 21 degrees of Libra. So Mars is tracking in this full moon chart the exact degree that we are going to have a solar eclipse in. And that portal of energy is already open anyway. It, solar eclipses especially have a six-month uh, window, three months prior to the actual date and three months post the date. So you might like to think about the Libra solar eclipse, which I am going to come back and talk about more thoroughly. Um, but that energy is actually open already. And given that Mars is tracking that degree right now, that's pretty significant. That's really highlighting the Libra part of our chart with the infusion of Mars energy through it. Um, now, the full moon in Libra is, in, in Aries rather, the sun is in Libra. The sun is conjunct Pallas Athena, and I think that's worth noting. Pallas Athena, as I said, is the, the archetype that corresponds to morning star Venus. And here we have Pallas Athena, who is a goddess that does bring in justice and fairness and equality. She's the protect, protectress of the state. She was the goddess queen of Athens. And when you go into Mesopotamian Babylonian times, she was the, um, the goddess called Ishtar of Akkad. Now, Pallas Athena has tremendous wisdom even when you look back to Ishtar of Akkad, which was a morning star warrior goddess, she had tremendous uh, wisdom and skills that she uh, brought forth in her, her rulership over the earth at the time. So every time we have a Venus morning star, um, which is Venus retrograde, right, which is every 19 months, that energy of that goddess rules over the earth and all earthly matters. Now, Pallas Athena here is conjunct the sun opposite the full moon in Libra. So given that we have the sun, Pallas Athena, Vulcan, which is always very close to the sun, this is an esoteric body, Mars in Libra and south node in Libra, quite a bit of Libran energy, which is following through from the fact that we had the, the equinox just a few days ago, right? It's the autumn equinox for you guys. It's the spring equinox for us in the Southern Hemisphere, which is really that halfway point of the zodiac. It's the halfway point of um, since the astrological new year as per the tropical zodiac, which is when the sun ingressed into Aries on the 21st of March. So we're at that halfway point of what we've been developing uh, in the world, in our life. And we're really at a very critical point from the point of view of looking at how things are balanced or imbalanced in our life. This happens every year. It's not a new thing. <clears throat> um, but we do have Pallas Athena in Libra. Now, the last time she was in Libra would have been about four years ago. So this is significant. She's conjunct the sun. She's opposite the full moon. And she brings in important matters to do with law, to do with fairness and justice and balance. And she brings in, um, she's armed with wisdom, actually. So I'm guessing that's going to speak to some consensus uh, collective matters on the earth plane around matters that have been unjust or unfair or imbalanced and something will come to light from that. And the other thing that I think, again, emphasises this even more, there's an asteroid called, um, a goddess called Astria, which is also an asteroid, and she's sitting right here actually. She's conjunct um, the goddess Vesta, which means she's actually squaring this sun and moon, this full moon. So there's a T-square with two goddesses. 
There's three goddesses in this picture, which is why I think it's worth mentioning. It's Vesta, goddess Astria, and goddess Pallas Athena. So very important goddess, powerful energies coming through this uh, very, very fiery uh, full moon in Aries. Now, the full moon in Aries can also be the energy of um, fighting for the underdog, um, tuning into just our, our own ability to stand up for ourselves, defend ourselves, fight for ourselves, help somebody else in, in their fight or their battle, as it were, right? It's, it's, a, it's an archetype that really does bring forth tremendous courage. Aries is um, fearless, just totally fearless. And that quality um, is so necessary sometimes in life with a lot of things that go on. We, we have to be courageous and we have to be fearless because I think when we, um, when, we don't, when we don't act through courage and fearlessness at, at different times, we, we are just um, engulfed by a program or lots of programs. We don't make our own decisions through our own um, our own thoughts, you know, our our own identity, our own understanding, um, making decisions for ourselves and so forth. Look at the world in the last three years, you know, most people jumped onto a ship that basically was a dictatorship. There was no sovereignty in that, no freedom. So, you know, being fearless and being courageous is important. The fact that we've got three goddess asteroids uh, lining up with this moon and, as I said, Pallas is, you know, uh, all about wisdom, creative intelligence, wisdom, um, standing up for what's right, what's fair, what's just, what's equal. Goddess Astria has a very similar kind of theme about her. She corresponds to Virgo and uh, Libra as well. She's known as the goddess of justice, actually. And she was one of the last goddesses that actually lived on the earth plane with, with humanity, as it were, during a particular age. And she was so... Um, it, it is said that she was she was so disgusted with the behaviour of the collective of the of of humanity of the way people were treating each other things that were going on that she just she just bailed she just didn't want to be a part of it anymore she wanted to just completely uh, leave the earth and she did and it, it's said that Zeus made her the constellation Virgo, actually. So she's connected to the constellation Virgo and she holds very strong principles that correspond to Libra, which is about fairness and justice. Um, because at the time that she left the earth, the reason she left is because of the huge imbalances that were occurring, the the injustices, that the, the behaviours that were just diabolical, which we're seeing very much today, aren't we? So she's actually squaring this full moon. So I would say that given that Pallas Athena is in Libra, which is an archetype that speaks to the law and justice and balance, and Astria speaks to, well, she's a goddess of justice, we might see some things that um, come to a head at this time of this full moon pertaining to earthly matters that correspond to laws and justice and fairness. So that's just a more broader kind of picture. Um, in this chart as well, there's quite a few other things going on too. Um, let me see. Okay, so Mars, <laughs> Pluto, Eris nodes. This is definitely not a lightweight pattern, aspect pattern. It's basically a T-square with Pluto, Mars, 
and Eris. Eris is actually Mars's sister. So she's the, the feminine equivalent to Mars, basically. And she's definitely uh, an authority in the world, particularly the last three years. She's, she's the goddess of discord and chaos, but primarily because she wants to bring equality and justice and fairness to matters on the earth as well. Things can't change um, when, um, when, when programs don't, don't get shaken up, as it were, you know, when, when the foundations aren't ruffled a bit and things don't get shaken up, things just remain uh, very stagnant and they just continue, continue, continue. And there's lots of things that have been continuing probably for thousands of years actually. And, you know, each kind of um, each century and then, you know, each decade and so on and so forth, there are different opportunities through different uh, portals of energies of the, the stars, the alignment of the stars and the alignment of the transiting planets that bring forth, you know, opportunities for stagnant things to be broken, broken open, removed. And for, for what? For the purposes of evolution, right? So it's things don't change easily. That's obvious, right? Um, the, the 3D world is, is basically controlled and dominated and ruled by Saturn, you know, at that everyday level. And Saturn rules walls and barriers. Um, you, you may think that you can drive through a brick wall, um, but you can't. <laughs> you can certainly imagine that you can, but the point I'm making is that this dense reality is so dense and it takes a long time for things to move and shift. But, you know, um, Eris in Aries, which has been there for a very, very long time and is coming, you know, sort of to the the last second of Aries anyway, right? She's at the 20, virtually the 25th degree, which is ramping up that energy of her placement in Aries, which is, again, why we're seeing um, such cataclysmic um, chaos and, and violence on the earth. She's in Aries, right, ruled by Mars. So anyway, here she is opposite Mars and that's obviously just a short transit because Mars will you know move along but it is you know activating a t-square with the nodes and with Pluto so I don't see that as being a particularly easy time on, on the earth plane and given that this is all really coming to culmination during the full moon which is in Aries which is ruled by Mars and Eris is in Aries you know, there there may be some some matters, some heated uh, or impulsive matters and actions that uh, take place on the Earth plane. That would not surprise me at all. But on the other hand, um, we do have Goddess Astria and Mars is in Libra, Sun's in Libra, Pallas Athena is in Libra. So there's a very important matter of of balance and justice that is also seeking to express and come through as well but that is a very powerful t-square and that could be very dangerous in certain ways as well for sure um what else um um i think I was just thinking as well that the the Libra and Venus star point that was activated in October of 2022, that seems like yesterday. And I just realised today it's, it's nearly a year since that star point was activated, which is just mind-boggling, like almost a year has gone in the flash. I think as we get older, time certainly does feel to 
go by a lot faster for sure. Um, I was just going to point out that Mars is also opposite Chiron, which happened again about two years ago because Chiron has been in Aries for a long time. Um, Aries is one of the signs that Chiron spends a really long time in. You know, I can't even remember exactly when Chiron went in Aries, but it was quite a few years ago now. So we had Mars in, in Libra two years ago because Mars, you know, has a sort of a two-year cycle thereabouts. So a couple of years ago, Mars was in Aries again. Uh, Mars was in Libra again, rather, opposite Chiron. And, you know, when you think about two years ago and you think about the present moment, in some ways not a lot has changed on, on the external world in the collective, you know. Um, it's a little bit concerning in in a lot of ways, you know, just from just from the um, level of that external narrative and things that are going on. Um, I really feel for Russell Brand. I don't know how you guys feel. Feel free to share your opinions, but please, you know, be as respectful as you can. You can hold your personal opinion. There's nothing wrong with that. But um, let's just remember that it's um, innocent until proven guilty, right, because at the moment uh, a lot of it is the other way around for him. So even though he's got a colourful history and a colourful background, that doesn't automatically mean that he's guilty and people need to remember that. I feel for him, he's got transiting Chiron uh, right on his moon while all this is happening. So this would be a very trying time for him. And I'm just thinking about it from the point of view of, you know, Mars um, being opposite this Chiron as well. A lot of people like to... Um, be prejudiced and shoot poisonous arrows. And like I said at the very beginning of this video, free speech has got nothing to do with, with um, a poisonous tongue. If you're speaking up through freedom of speech on matters that are um, morally and ethically and... Um, correct and are about justice and equality and fairness well that will not hurt anybody you see so that's why there's a difference between freedom of speech and just being a nasty individual because of your own dissatisfaction or whatever it may be and you know even with Russell Brand you know there's so many people um well, it's a clear division, and he is a Gemini, and Gemini is often uh, are the ones that create division. And so we have, you know, this side over here that are for him, and we have this side over here that are, are against him. And that that's fine. That's just what happens in situations. But like I said, you know, innocent until proven guilty. People seem to forget that one. <laughs> Um, anyway, look, I'll, I think I'll leave it there. That's kind of really the, the, the gist of it all. Um, happy full moon in Aries and, uh, yeah, just let it um, perhaps be a vehicle for energising you. Aries is about energy, vitality, personal power, um, courage, initiation, starting new things and so forth. And, you know, it's a full moon and people will say, well, you never start things on new on full moons. That's not true. That's absolute crap. You can absolutely start something at a full moon. Why? Because the full moon gives you illumination, doesn't it? Which means it gives you awareness over what's going on. And it is through awareness that we become informed about things in our life that might lead us to taking on something else, dropping something, discarding something, um, starting something new, because now I see this, I see that, and I know what I need to do. That's why you can start something new during the full moon. <laughs> In fact, it's funny, you know, because 
there's so much um there's so much banging of the drum of new moons and you know everyone sets their intentions oh it's a new moon cycle you know let's start this let's do that fact is that that new moon is a seed the full moon is the rose in the garden so you may set your intentions but at the full moon is where you will actually really see the fruit of where you've been of what your intentions were um what's kind of transpired and what you're going to do about it now which direction are you going to go in it's so obvious it's like a no-brainer anyway um also i think uh worth mentioning is that uranus is quincunx pluto yeah mars sorry um yeah and this is an interesting little signature, but, you know, look, a queen conks has a lot of different layers to it, but one of the main things that I often see with transiting planets in a queen conks or in conjunct aspect is that we change our mind about something. We let something go. We just move on from something because we've figured out that it, it just it's not for us. It, it's, it's not working for us or we've outgrown it or whatever it may be. So it's a it's a parting of ways of something. What's the parting of ways here? Well, it's got to do with Mars and Uranus. So it's got to do, it's your actions at this point with Mars in Libra. The Mars in Libra will help you weigh everything up about your personal desires and goals and which direction you want to go in, right? And Uranus is always about freedom. It is in Taurus, the sign of money as well. So it may, ha may have to do with some financial goals or matters or plans that you had that you change the course of direction here because something comes to light with the full moon. Remember, Mars rules the full moon. So Mars being in conjunct with Uranus is important here as well. I think I'll leave it there and I'll see you guys um, really soon with what's coming up next, solar eclipse uh, in Libra in two weeks' time and other things going on as well. I'll do my best to jump on and bring some more material. I'm um, trying to balance things out myself at the moment with, um, you know, classes and um, studying. I'm actually studying Babylonian astrology at a sort of serious level at the moment because it's something that I really want to down the track teach and bring more of it into my uh, presentations here on YouTube as well. I'm just, I'm really in love with um, these ancient teachings I always was which is why I studied medieval astrology back in the late 90s it was um, although medieval astrology is not necessarily the same as uh, Babylonian astrology but there are some matters that cross over and, and certainly do connect um, I guess the main common thing they have is that they're both ancient as it were, but certainly Babylonian is really ancient. And having Rum and Collins program is, well, it's an absolute gift to have it, which it was gifted to me, and I'm very grateful to that soul who gave it to me. She knows who she is. Um, but, I, I, you know, it's, and it's, like it actually is very interesting because my classes um, have started um, and my invitation into Babylonian astrology has started. All this started when the Libran Venus star point, which took place last year in October, for the first time in over 100 years, was exactly opposite my sun and Mercury, exactly. 
And I knew it was going to be, how can I put it? I knew that it was going to be something around more study and learning and teaching for myself from an astrological perspective, but I didn't have a plan as to how that was going to unfold. It it really just happened very organically and very spontaneously. And although I'm a really considerate and deep thinker, I'm actually a Mercury evening star by birth as well, which is the Hermes energy of Mercury. The morning star is the Apollo energy of um, Mercury, which is what Mercury is at the moment. Mercury is a morning star, so he holds that Apollo vibration and energy, which is the light and truth. Um, so even though I do take time to contemplate and consider things quite a lot. My Mercury is retrograde as well and it's in a water house. When it comes to the divine timing of things, it I have such a trust, such a deep, deep trust in the divine plan that things just unfold naturally in, in their own time without me even needing to um, to try and make it happen as it were. And I think that's a valuable lesson because sometimes we can be so stubborn and so persistent and we think that we, you know, we, no, we need to make this happen right now or, or yesterday and, and there's resistances, um, as it were, opposing, opposing us, opposing what we're trying to do. There's a reason for that. You know, we the personality has a very different agenda to the soul for the most part. So it is about recognising and tuning into that the divine plan, the script of your soul, and honouring that, respecting that, respecting that there is a divine time in everything and, and also remembering that we cannot have everything at once. No one can. That's not how it's uh, intended. We can have everything, and the reason we can have everything is because we have multiple lives, and so through each life we experience different things that we desire and seek to have and so forth. But we cannot have everything at once. It's just not possible. Um, and also, as I was saying, you know, there's a, there's a timing for everything. So for me, I'm just very, very aware that this uh, Libra and Venus star point and then the Leo Venus star point, those two star points have been really powerful uh, in my life, you know, in the last um, 10, 11 months. And I'm, I'm just very, very aware of that and very grateful for it and um, really look forward to, to sharing my Babylonian um, learning <laughs> and teachings uh, with you guys moving forward you know that will take time because it's such a vast um, field of study but I'm not shy of um, dedication towards learning and studying when it comes to do with God's language which is the stars so yeah, that's going to be exciting as it unfolds. All right, I'll see you guys very, very soon. Much love. Um, stay free, as Russell Brand says. Um, stay authentic to who you are. Be kind, be respectful. That's important. See you soon.